everyone, what's up? Goldie here, and I'm going to be hopefully quickly going over the early 10 game main slate. Um, we've got the got the slate starting here in about three hours, so uh, I'm going to try and keep this as condensed as possible and really just go through, we're not going to go through a lot of numbers, I don't think, necessarily, and because pretty much every damn guy that we have on the mound here today is in play, and you could make an argument uh, for most everybody here. I think there's going to be some pretty obvious spots that we can target instead. Um, and maybe that's a, a decent construction. Get pretty chalky in a batter's box or, or go with some chalkier teams. Yeah, you'll have to get different with them still. But then just mix in a bunch of different pitchers because there's some ownership here that I think we can exploit. Notably with Luis Castillo, um, there's, like I said, there's literally like 10 or 12 guys that we could play today on the mound. I am not eating 40% ownership on a guy um, with him or, or with Burns. I don't think the spot is all that great for Burns, to be quite honest. Um, and the spot is a little bit better for Luis Castillo, but is it really? I don't know. We'll kind of get into it when we go over that, but I'm not going to be eating a lot of uh, ownership here. I think there's plenty of guys here that have a lot of upside, that are, are far, far less popular. Uh, yeah, I, I know what the projection says for Luis Castillo. But, um, you know, sometimes we have to, we just have to take stands. And on days like this where you have Zach Wheeler, Pablo Lopez, Tyler Glasnow is back today, Chris Bassett, Corbin, I mean, you have Corbin Burns. But you also have Charlie, right? Um, you have Framber and Logan Webb. You have Andrew Heaney who has strikeout upside. Probably not the spot for him, but... Uh, you have Luis Severino down here at 7000 This is the cheapest price tag we've seen him at in, in like, six, seven years, right? So uh, you've got some other anything. He's at 8% is Severino. So you've got some other pretty uh, attackable spots in the ownership department for sure. And look at these projections so far in the early going. Everybody down here, you know, below... 8,000, call it, below Charlie Morton is project. They're basically the same play, right, in terms of raw projection. You got a two or three point delta here or there or, or whatever, but everybody down here is basically the same play. Um, yeah, you got Seve standing out a little bit. Uh, everybody above that, up to Wheeler, right, in about a $1,000 range, basically the same play. However, we still have we have Corbin Burns standing here with 30% ownership. Why is he getting all of the ownership? Yeah, the matchups are there or whatever, but um, I mean, I think his matchups just as bad. Like, and his numbers have been just as bad. So, uh, you get up into the top range outside of the Luis Castillo outlier here. You got Logan Webb and Kershaw, basically the same play, right? In terms of projection, Framber and Castillo, yeah, they're the ones standing out in pro in raw projection here. Um. So why don't we get up to Framber? He's only seeing 20%. And he gets Oakland. You know, so I think there's some very exploitable spots here in the ownership department here in the early runs. Um, we're still, we still got some noise to flesh out over the next couple hours as it, there's a pretty big slate and we got some of the industry models have uh, yet to wake up for some reason. Um, so as soon as uh, everybody gets their, their, their legs under them here this morning, then we should see things kind of flatten out if they don't flatten out like i said like let's let's go attack some stuff so um that's kind of the overview here i think you play a ton of guys and let's just get into it real quick um and start with michael walker i think he's in play here he throws this change up this has always been his best pitch uh four seamer two seamer has been pretty equitable for him he's throwing this cutter to right handers for some stupid reason um this is not a pitch that you throw to right handers because it tails over the barrel. Um, you know, you throw this to opposite-handed hitter so you can get it in on the hands. So I don't know what he's doing uh, throwing this pitch. That's why he's seeing so much negative value and giving up some pop to the righties a little bit here at a full buck 60 ISO. Uh, now, he does throw the righty-righty change a lot. Um, so that keeps the, the ISO number down because it's a very, very good pitch for him. And he's been spotting with the four-seamer and the two-seamer. So it's fine. You know, the arsenal has been really good for him. So I think he's in play here. Um, nothing super impressive for Michael Walker, but 
I I mean, we're getting him at, at sub 2% ownership. I, yeah, it's a dangerous matchup. He's at Yankee Stadium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but we're, we're getting him, you know, at what? A 20th or a 25th of the ownership of Corbin Burns. And he's 1,200 cheaper. Um, the strikeout rate is the exact same. We'll get to that with Burns and illustrate that when we get there, you know, but uh, I think Michael Walker's arsenal overall is, is more balanced than Corbin Burns, even though Corbin Burns has a really good pitch. So I think he's in play here at 7,100. Um, not my favorite. I'm not going to go out of my way to land on this. I think you're still going to need with all these arms going, you're going to need 25. And some of these guys are going to pop for 30 here today. I think, uh, does Michael Walker have that in the tank? I mean, I think he's got it in the tank more often than one and a half percent of the time. So I think the I think he's in play. Um, targeting the Yankees here. And really a lot of these guys are gonna struggle pretty significantly with the same handed change. And that's how Michael Walker can excel here, is throwing this change up a lot to the two right handed hitters. Uh, in particular Aaron Judge. That's his biggest weakness. It's a same handed change up. So Seve on the other side, I think he's very much in play too, as I mentioned. This is one of the cheapest price tags we've seen him since, like, 2016. Like, every now and then, at the beginning of the season over the last couple of years, you've seen him down in the mid-7Ks for one start. But then he he pops really hard, and then you see him at, you'll see him cheaper than 9K for the rest of the season. I think we may very well may see the same sort of dynamic here happen with Seve. Um, he threw, what, 75 pitches in his last outing, and... Uh, he should be good for 80, 85 here. Um, I have no problems with this going after San Diego. Now, Seve's problems in the past have mostly been to the left side of the plate. Um, he's given up significantly more production pretty much across the board in average WOBA. I so we, we obviously don't have his numbers in here in the sheet. But uh, in average WOBA, ISO, strikeout rate is far lower, hard contact rates are higher, soft contact rates are lower, uh, ground ball to fly ball ratio is neutral to the left side of the plate, whereas to righties, he's far, far better. So if we're going to be playing, uh, I think it's a more, much more dangerous spot, to be quite honest, for Severino than it is for Waka, uh, even though I would probably say that the Yankees lineup is a little scarier. Um, I think Severino has a, a few more significant holes um and it's still early season for Seve here so if I had to choose I would side with the Padres here um I mean you still got to lay a dollar fifty on the Yankees in the betting markets I think that number is too high and laying laying three to two on them right here I think San Diego is very much in play uh now don't get me wrong I don't want to go out of my way to play walk uh, and stack against Severino or anything like this um, but you can play some of these lefties over here. Jake Cronenworth, 4,300. That's a very playable first and second base piece. Uh, Soto, of course, 58. Finally, we're seeing Soto hit the baseball. Uh, Rugi is okay at 2,700. He stinks, but he's, he's fine at Yankee Stadium. Uh, Carp is also fine at 2,900, first and third base. Um, and then you can throw in like a Brett Sullivan. I'm not, I still don't play Trent Grisham. I think he's awful. Um, but you can play some of these other righties as well that don't strike out at a very high clip. Xander has seen Seve plenty, of course, and uh, Hassan Kim as well. And you can play Tatis literally every single day against everybody. So uh, I'd rather get to the Padres than the Yankees. Uh, I trust Michael Walker. Don't tell anybody I said trust Michael Walker. But I do trust him a little bit more in this particular matchup, given Seve's history against left-handers in particular. Uh, but they're both, I think, underpriced for where they probably should be, and I think they're both in play. So if you land on either one of these guys, I'm really not going to go after you um, since Padres have been horrible against right-handed pitching this season. Okay, let's move on. Uh, the White Sox and the Tigers. Jesse Schultons has come out of the bullpen three times. In his last start, though, or last uh, outing, I should say, uh, he went. He was a long reliever, and he went a full five innings. So he stretched out enough. Um However, at 5,000 here, I don't think you need to get down here today. I don't think you need to go this cheap. But look at this projection for a guy at 5,000. Like, this is a high number. Um, and if we're targeting, you know, whatever, 160 points in, in DK lineups here, I mean, this is a, one of the higher target scores 
four starting pitcher or, or target you know projection to target values I should say um so I think that's in play if you find a way to get to a very expensive offense and another expensive arm or something um but really like do you want to be stacking a bunch of super expensive offenses here today yeah you could you could stack San Diego right um you could stack Texas right you can stack Houston we'll get to all of those um but outside of that, like, do you really want to be stacking Atlanta against Zach Wheeler or Philly against Charlie? Um, you know, it's kind of hard to get to there, I think. You want to stack the Dodgers against Glasnow or Tampa against Kershaw? I mean, not particularly, right? So I'm not sure you're going to need to get all the way down here to capitalize on some of this projection down here. But he's, he's completely off the board, and he's in play, given this very cheap price tag. And, he, you know, he's going to be stretched out. And he gets the Tigers here. The Tigers are terrible um, against right-handed pitching for sure. You can attack this absolutely. Uh, 6,800 on the mound for... Detroit and Michael Lorenzen. I don't think we're going to be able to get get here today. However, um, this is one of the few matchups, kind of in the mid range, that I'm not super attracted to. Um, now Lorenzen got picked apart in his last start. Who was it by the Royals? I believe. Um, he's starting to regress a little bit to the real Michael Lorenzen. That doesn't strike anybody out. He can survive. He's got enough junk in the arsenal that he can throw to survive. But none of it's really all that great. And he's got an okay four-seamer so far this season that he's establishing with, but everything else is terrible. Uh, really just giving up outs to the field with every one of his pitches here. And he's throwing a lot of them. So since he's throwing so much, he could keep the White Sox off balance because this offense is horrible too. Just an 81 WRC plus against righties so far this season. As you can see, we do have lineups and initial projections coming in. Um... But so they've been bad, but they're really not going to strike out at anything more than an average clip here. Could he suppress for five, six innings? Uh, yeah, and he's super off the board and not popular at all. Um, so that keeps him in play. But at 6,800, I don't know. I think there's. I'd rather play Michael Walker. I'd rather play Sevy. I think than Lorenzen. I'm more comfortable with those guys and their upside, even in worse matchups or worst run production matchups or run suppression matchups, I should say, than really uh, Michael Lorenzen here. So I'm not super thrilled about going after this um, at 68. I think there's just other guys I'd rather pivot to, but the projection, he, like he's in play. Um, you know, once again, we're gonna, like I said, we're going to talk about this in pretty much every game. Damn near every single starting pitcher is in play for one reason or another, um, far more so than a typical 10-game slate. So, He's in play. It's just not all that thrilling to go after the White Sox here. Uh, I don't really want to stack Chicago necessarily because, like I said, they're bad, but they're very playable price tags. If you want to go after a guy that historically doesn't have a lot of swing and miss and he's going to throw strikes, um, just pitch to a, a large amount of contact, like White Sox totally off the board here. I think this is very reasonable. Uh, you're in a big ballpark, but it's a day game, and it'll play up power a little bit more. So I think that's perfectly reasonable targeting some – um, it's like a an AL Central matchup here for some offense. And you can go after a young arm of Jesse Schultons too uh, with some of the Tigers, some of these righties, or excuse me, some of these lefties hit righties pretty well. So um, a lot of stuff is, is really in play in that game. Um, okay, Chris Bassett on the mound for Toronto against Pablo Lopez. Both of these guys are also in play. I would say probably less so with Chris Bassett just because I think he's got a little bit more susceptibility to the left side. I'm not, like his... A few of his last outings have very have been really, really strong. Been going deep into games. He's throwing a lot of stuff here, right? Got a full six pitches he's working with. And none of them are really all that equitable outside of the two-seamer. And unfortunately, the two-seamer against opposite-handed hitters is not great, right? And that's why we see, with the lack of a changeup and a raw swing and miss pitch, like a curveball, for example, against the left side of the plate, we're seeing a lot of power materialize here. Not so much in average, but a 358 Woba sort of buoyed a, a good bit by a, an elevated walk rate to the left side, leading to the 258 ISO. It's not so much hard contact. You know, 31% 31%. It's fine. But it's a fly ball lean here with an elevated line drive rate to the left side. So if I had to choose um, 
I think I would choose Pablo at 8,700 as opposed to Chris Bassett. I think his arsenal is better, and I think the matchup is far better here. He's throwing this sweeper. It's categorized as a slider here in the sheet, but it is the sweeper, and he's throwing this a boatload to the right side of the plate. We've been targeting um, Toronto with guys that have very equitable sliders really for the last, I mean, six, eight years, uh, and they're exhibiting those old ways once again this season. I think this is a fantastic spot for Pablo uh, because this is a really damn good pitch. He's got a 40% whiff rate on his slider, and he only throws it about to like a 95% clip to the right side of the plate. Uh, he's very balanced here. He doesn't throw this two-seamer at all to lefties. He's only four-seamer and, and curveball change to the left side. So he's throwing his good stuff into good matchups, and he's not throwing the bad stuff into bad matchups. So that's exactly what we want to see. And despite Toronto being a pretty decent offense that could be heating up a little bit, they're fine against right-handers. 21% K rate, 113 WRC+, plus, some hard contact. I think it's a really good matchup for Pablo. Pablo's going to struggle a little bit more against lefty lineups, or lefty heavy lineups, and that is not Toronto, uh, even though they've got a couple of guys that they can't throw in now. Um like a T Tyler Heineman behind the plate, for example, they just had to put Danny Jansen on the DL. So, but Tyler Heineman's really, are you, we really scared about this? Um, not necessarily. So I would like to play a good bit of Pablo here, but once again, Chris Bassett is, is in play. Um, I would rather play some of the lefties from the twins, like an Eddie Julian or an Alex Kirilov. We'll see what they want to do with Gallo. Who knows if he's hurt? Who knows if he's going to strike out 84 times? Uh, whatever. But they've got, uh, they brought, uh, Matt Walner back up. So they've got some lefties that they can go after uh, Bassett here with, but he could very well survive. And at 8,500, it's a playable price tag for him at very low ownership. Nice projection for both of these guys. Nice ownership figures. Nice sheets value scores. So I, I think that's all in play. If I had to decide, it'd be Pablo and the Twins, and the Twins lefties mostly. Um, but you play some righties from the Twins as well because of the strikeout rate two righties against Bassett or four Bassett against right-handers is, um, you know, just two ticks below average here. So a lot of soft contact there. So not my favorite, but uh, would prefer probably like Pablo and short stacks for the twins or something like that. Okay. Here's one of the teams I think we can get, we can get to full stacks with, and that's the Texas Rangers. Uh, if you want to play Heaney, well, he's got high strikeout upside and he's actually thrown full three pitches. Look at the change up usage this season, full 21% now. And it's not getting totally blasted. So look at that. At a boy, Andy Heaney. Um, really like to see this. Slider value still leaving it on the table a little bit. But look at the hard contact. It, it's totally evaporated for Heaney. Like he has solved the hard contact issues in this short sample here so far. Um, there's still a lot of variance with him because he still walks people, just sprays it occasionally. And if he loses the mechanics even slightly, these power numbers to righties, they balloon. And... And the, ball, and the baseball starts going over the wall, as we see here in just 170 hitter sample, 1.8 homers per nine still to the right side with the 200 ISO and a 333 WOBA. So fly balls are still coming there, but the overall line drive rate, it's decreased. And the hard contact rate, as I mentioned, has dropped off a cliff against the right side. Still on the barrel a little bit, but 8.5% is a pretty damn good number for Andy Heaney. Um... I think this make this puts him in play at this price tag with this arsenal and with these with this batted ball profile here. Um, plate discipline's still all good, throwing strikes, but this is a horrible matchup. So I don't really want to play Andy Heaney. Uh, I think there's other guys I'd just rather pivot to. Um, but he has strikeout upside. Do you really want to go after Baltimore, though, with a 20% K rate? They have an 11% walk rate and a 119 WRC+, 183 ISO, 342 WOBA against lefties this year. Uh, that's pretty stiff to get through, man, pretty stiff. Um, I don't think I want to do it, to be quite honest. Now, they're not creating as much on the base pass, but they'll still have guys that can run. Cedric, Ramon Urias, he's got a little bit of speed. He'll run. Um, Georgie Mateo will run if he can get on base. You can play some of these righties here. We'll see what they want to do with the lineup. They'll probably have Cedric down at the bottom against a, you know, a lefty who's pretty good against lefties. Um, but Ryan Mountcastle, very playable, 45. Rutch, not so much. 
at uh, 51 from the right side, but he got into a ball, uh, hit a tank shot last night. So maybe seeing the baseball a little bit better, that will help him from the right side a little bit as well. Um, I want to play some Texas, however, against Dean Kramer for sure. I I think he's one of the few guys that is not in play. Uh, all of the metrics here, strikeout rate, you know, he's throwing a lot of strikes, but he's pitching to a lot of contact and most of it's hard contact. 30 37% in aggregate here. And it's to both sides. He's not walking anybody. He's just six and a half percent aggregate walk rate to both sides of the plate. But these numbers against lefties: 3.51 average allowed, 4.05 wOBA, and 1.85 ISO to the left side with a 40 percent hard contact. No, thank you. Uh, day game in Baltimore. We're not going to be dealing with this against Texas. Uh, I am totally off of Dean Kramer. Not going near him. It, it's pretty rare I play him anyway. This is a playable price tag. So if you get down here and you land on him, I mean, sure. If you want to take, like, some super deep tournament shots, like, by all means, um, it's your money. But I, I'm not doing it. I, I think he's probably in to get torn apart here today. Um, so I like offense pretty much exclusively here. I'm just off of Heaney because of the very bad matchup. And I don't want to play Dean Kramer because I think Texas is elite. They're very expensive, though. So if you need to get down to somebody uh, on the mound uh, or maybe – get to a cheaper stack or something um you know texas is a very high up again they put up 15 runs or whatever they did yesterday very high upside offense here so i like uh, offense mostly exclusively here one of the few games i'll say that houston and oakland uh framber on the mound at 10 7 yeah he's very playable at at this at this price tag in general for this matchup because oakland is terrible his arsenal in particular should be able to pick through oakland pretty well even though they are far better against lefties than they are against righties. 107 WRC+. Plus. It's starting to, to drop off the table a little bit here. 21.5% K rates, pretty good number. 155 ISO, pretty good number. Not not, not so much in, in hard contact, but they'll get the baseball on a line. Um, however, with Framber, this is one of the few guys, one of the few lefties I would be pretty excited about playing uh, against Oakland, even though I've, I've taken shots a couple of times this season expecting them to just, like, be Oakland. But uh, Framber, with a very, very high ground ball rate, um, even anybody that does get on base, he's going to be able to get out of these jams because he gets so many ground balls. Now, his changeup has been horrible this year. He is right in the middle of the plate, uh, and this is really what's given him a lot of problems. We see with a 42% hard contact rate to the to right-handers this year, that's because the changeup has been terrible. Um, if he can figure out what's going on with this pitch. It's only a five by now, five mile an hour velo delta to the fastballs here. He needs to figure this out and this would increase this, this uh, ground ball to fly ball ratio back up to four where it's been in the past couple of seasons. Um, nothing wrong with him. It's just a, a price tag that you got to balance with him. If you can get all the way up there, given the 26 arms that we can play on the mound today. Yeah, go ahead. I have no problems with this. I think this ownership number is exploitable in this particular matchup. Um, so go ahead. And you're absolutely going to be stacking Houston again. It looks like it's going to be uh, Hogan Harris. He had one appearance out of the bullpen and gave up five runs earlier this season. But they haven't announced anybody officially, so that's why I don't have anybody in the sheet. Um, but it doesn't really matter who it is. You could stack against everybody in their starting rotation. You can stack against their entire bullpen. Um, even in a bullpen game, it does not matter. With Houston, uh, this is another very high upside offense that you can get to that probably isn't coming in as popular as they should today. So full on Houston and really just zero Oakland for me. Um, even like an Asteri Ruiz or Brent Rooker, who I like playing against lefties, not against Framber. No, thank you. Okay. Uh, let's move on quickly to Kershaw and Tyler Glasnow going for the Dodgers and the Rays. Kershaw at 95. I don't know. He's probably just going to miss the cut for me here today. I love Kershaw, but I hate this matchup. Uh, against right-handers this season, I mean, this is Tampa, or excuse me, against left-handers, um, this is Tampa, 162 WRC+, plus. are you kidding me? 21% aggregate K rate, 34% hard, 273 aggregate ISO with a neutral ground ball to fly ball. I mean, this team is just absolutely deadly against both righties and lefties. That's a shorter sample against lefties, of course, but um, no thank you for Kershaw and, like, I know the projection is high, and I know the ownership is low, and yeah, this is Kershaw, and I love Kershaw. He's fine in the value score. There's nothing wrong fundamentally here, 
Like, the guy's mom just died, you know? So we can kind of give him a break for not having his best stuff in his last two outings. Um, you know, he's not going to want to admit it, but, like, that shit wear is going to wear on you. And, sorry, I'm just not playing, even if he's the best pitcher, one of the best pitchers in baseball, I'm just not playing a guy in, in the worst matchup in baseball uh, after his mom just died. You know, it's going to take a little bit of time. Maybe maybe he comes out and, and has one of those... Um, has one of those outings or, or whatever, but I don't know. I, I just can't do it. I know what the numbers say, but even still, the numbers, from a raw numbers perspective, they're going to tell you to stay away from this. Even at this particular price tag, there's too many other guys today. I, I'm just going to leave him on the shelf. Tyler Glass, now I'll probably have a little bit of this. Uh, 8,600, he's back. He's four-seamer slider curveball guy. Really didn't have a change, so he's a little susceptible to lefties on occasion. He can spray it on occasion, uh, but he's got the upper 90s velo, um, very hard 91, 92 mile an hour slider, and a very hard curveball at 84. So um, he has looked excellent and appears to be totally healthy coming off of, it's the oblique now, but he had TJ as well. Um, this is all. This is probably the second worst matchup in baseball, <laughs> you know, unfortunately. So uh, is he going to be fully stretched out? Probably not. So we're, we're looking at probably 75 pitches or so for Glass now, 75 to 80. I think that's probably his ceiling, and they're going to be very careful with him. They got so many injuries here in the starting rotation um, that, that they need Glass now back. So they are not going to push him. They'll be, I think, at 8,600 in this particular matchup. I'm going to have some because I, I really like the upside. When I go after the Dodgers, it's really only with guys that can blow it past them because they still have guys that strike out a good bit. But, man, this is a, like I said, it's the second worst matchup in baseball for a starting pitcher, uh, righty or lefty. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, this is probably one of the games that uh, I'll have a little bit of glass now, but I'm not going to have any offense. You know, I, I just don't want to stack against either of these guys. If you want to stack either one of them, go ahead. Because this is the two best offenses in baseball. So, yeah, like by all means, go nuts. But uh, I'm not going to be doing it. I'll have a little bit of glass now because I like I, – I really love this arm. And I think he's got – like he's got a 30% aggregate K rate, you know. Um, he is one of the very few guys that I'm super comfortable going after the Dodgers with. And, uh, yeah, I'll have a little bit. It's not – it's probably not going to be up to 12%. Um, but I'll, I'm going to have a little bit of coverage because I love the arm. Probably just no Dodgers and no Kershaw for me. Okay, Philly and Atlanta, let's move on. Zach Wheeler, I think he's in play, right? At 8,900, absolutely, certainly at 8.5% ownership, even in a bad matchup. Now, he has been really struggling. Um, yeah, he's kind of reverting, even though we thought that Wheeler was going to kind of come out of his early season slump here. He's reverted back to it in two of his last three starts when he had very attackable spots, San Francisco and Arizona, um, the suppression just has not been there overall. The, the strikeout stuff is not the problem. That's there, right? It's to both sides of the plate. But he's given up a lot of average here to the left-handers. He's just on the barrel and is not getting enough swing and miss to them. Um, off the top of my head, don't know exactly how much he's throwing this two-seamer to the left side of the plate, but I can tell you that he's getting blasted by the curveball here. Uh, it has just been awful. He's hanging it right over the middle. Um so that's leading to a lot of the average. Not so much in hard contact necessarily, so it's not going over the wall. And he doesn't walk people, but this is a high Woba, and it's because of the average here against the left side of the plate. Still induces a lot of soft contact. So that doesn't really make me all that enthused about stacking the Braves here uh, because he's elite against the right-handers, right? And the left-handers, although they're going to hit for a little bit of average, they've only got three lefties in the lineup that you're – really all that comfortable playing um it's, it's matt olson it's eddie rosario yeah sure i guess it's all these two uh, and then you have michael harris down at the bottom of the lineup but harris has been largely terrible outside of the dinger that he hit yesterday so i'm not super thrilled about stacking atlanta and i think at this particular price tag wheeler is underpriced for his upside this is the lowest price we've seen him all season as well um you know, he's been mid-9Ks and, and even upper 10Ks in a couple of starts. So I think he's very attackable. He's one of the few guys with enough whiff stuff that I'm willing to go after Atlanta with. 
Um, I think he's very much in play at very low ownership. Yeah, go ahead. Charlie Morton, I think he's also in play. He is very high K stuff. And everybody in the middle of the lineup here for the Phillies, they're striking out a truckload right now, including Kyle Schwarber. I, I guess mostly Kyle Schwarber. He's striking out at a 30% clip to both sides of the plate. He has been awful. And when he makes contact, it's going to go a long way. And this is a plus batted ball matchup for Schwarber in particular, but he has to make contact first. And if Charlie's got the curveball biting, he's still got a 26% K rate to the left side of the plate. If I had to choose here, I would choose Philly because I trust Bryce Harper and a little bit more um, of Kyle Schwarber to get after Charlie Morton and the, the curveball just being bad eventually uh, for Charlie. Uh, then I would trust all of the Braves getting after Zach Wheeler. So if I had to choose, it'd be Philly and going after Charlie Morton, because if the curveball is bad, everything else is atrocious. So he does not get any value out of any of the fastball mix. Um, and the, the changeup is break even, but, you know, slide or whatever is kind of a slurve. So if the, if this curveball is bad, what it, what does he have to go to bat with, so to speak, uh, on the mound? He doesn't have anything else. He's having trouble throwing strikes. So if he starts walking people and the curveball is bad, like – you could see the Phillies put up a real crooked number here, but he does still have swing and miss. Um, not so much to the right side of the plate. And Philly's still pretty difficult to, to go after, but at this particular price tag with the swing and miss in the middle of the lineup, I think he's, he's still in play. Um, I'll probably have a little bit of Philly because they're the one offense. I think that I'm okay going after. Oh, okay. With going after uh, an arm, that I'm also comfortable playing. Uh, so, like, I think a lot of sides are playable here in this game. I'm pretty much off of Atlanta's offense. But if you want to go after Zach Wheeler, he's not really been all that equitable, to be quite honest. Uh, they're going to strike out, but if Wheeler is off even just a little bit, he has not been able to suppress a lot of production here, um, despite what the ERA says. His, his ERA is inflated, so if you're looking for some regression, positive regression for him, it's going to come in a strand rate and a regression back toward the XFIP a little bit. Um, so that's great, which is why I would prefer Zach Wheeler here at $1,000 more expensive and some of the Phillies. But uh, pretty much everybody is in play, I think. Okay, San Francisco and Milwaukee, both of these arms are in play. 10-1 on the mound for Logan Webb. Um, this makes it a little bit harder for me to get to him. Now, I, he's been very consistent all season. 70% uh, strike one rate is elite. The chase rate here is elite, uh, 36%. Swing and strike rate, not so much, but he's got so much chase and so many called strikes that it keeps his CSW uh, north of 30% here. High strand rate, so if we're going to see a little bit of regression, that's probably where it'll come. But for Logan Webb, this is a sustainable number because he's got such a high ground ball rate. Um, the hard contact and soft contact numbers are great. The average allowed, the WOBA, the ISO, all of it's excellent. He's going to see a little bit lower strikeout rate against the lefties. Um, that's because his main pitch to stay down in the strike zone is a two-seamer, not really a whiff pitch necessarily, but he's got an elite changeup, and he throws a slider as well to keep them off balance. So that's why we don't see as much swing and miss to the left-handers, but he's really got it against the righties. And Milwaukee, they just lost Willie Adamas. He's not going to be in the lineup today because he's on a concussion DL. So um, I think you can very much go after Milwaukee in this particular matchup, even against right-handers. They're not all that good. 98 WRC plus, 23% K rate. It's about average. They'll make a little bit of hard, 32.5% year, but all of it's going to be on the ground against Logan Webb, so I don't really care. Um, 318 Woba, everything is, is average here. So if you... If you want to play some Logan Webb at a reduced ownership figure, I think this is perfectly reasonable. Yeah, go ahead. Um, he's been going deep into games, six and two-thirds nearly in every single start. That is very equitable with this kind of strikeout stuff um, it, against Milwaukee. This is just a, I mean, it's a blow average offense, I think. Corbin Burns on the mound. He's getting all the ownership here in this range, and I don't think this is warranted, to be quite honest. He has a 21.5% aggregate strikeout rate. And 8300 yeah, it's a fine price tag. Is he probably underpriced for his relative upside? Eh, maybe. But Houston took him apart in his last start, um, and he was also very popular. 
I'm not going to be doing this. I know what the projection says. I know that there's high strikeout upside against San Francisco in general, right? 25% aggregate K rate. But we saw what they did to Freddie Peralta yesterday. All right, they jumped on him. They put up 14 runs or whatever it was. 108 WRC plus, very dangerous. This team hits for power. So despite the fact that they're going to strike out, Corbin Burns, just a, as I said, 21.5% to both sides of the plate here. He throws the cutter. It's not a strikeout pitch. Change-up curveball should be with pitches for him, but they're just not. He just does not get to swing and miss. So I'm not eating north of 30% ownership on, on the guy uh, when he has depressed strikeout metrics and he can play 11 other guys in a range. I'm, I'm just not doing it. Um, I, I will come in underweight to this. I'll have a little bit because, yeah, the Giants, if they go cold, they're still a three true outcome team that will walk, hit the ball over the wall, and strike out. Uh, so there is upside at this price tag. So you'll have a little bit of coverage. I think you, I think that's definitely warranted. But getting over the field and just clicking this in in single entry, three max, um, and getting over the field in 20 max, I think that's a mistake. So I'm I'm gonna, not going to be doing it, and that's the stand I'm going to take here. And to try and capitalize on some of these other very high upside arms, I don't think there's a reason to be eating this kind of ownership on a pitcher today. Um, that doesn't mean I want to stack the Giants, but yeah, go ahead if you want to. We, like I said, you saw what they did to Freddie Peralta yesterday, and he was popular a little bit as well. So go ahead. He's, only, he's not going to throw it past these guys all that regularly. Uh, and I think the ownership is quite outsized to where it really should be. So, yeah, give me some of the Giants. Go ahead. Um, okay, Pittsburgh against Seattle. Same thing. We'll get to Luis Castillo in a minute. I'm not playing Vince Velasquez. Uh, he's coming off of elbow inflammation and coming off the DL, and I do not screw around with that uh, with starting pitchers. You have to prove to me that you are healthy um, because that is a, a very ominous DL stint with elbow inflammation, with a guy that's had elbow problems in the past. I'm not going anywhere near this. That doesn't mean I really want to play Seattle because, like, I went on the rant with Mitch Keller last night, and, yeah, he didn't have his best stuff, and they made me look stupid a little bit um, since I was so bullish on it. But I, I had a crap load of him, okay? so um, And he still put up 15 points. It wasn't like it was a horrible outing because the strikeout stuff was still there, and... That's why I don't really want to play Seattle all the time. This is not a good offense, man. They are just as bad um, as, as some of these other teams that we go after every single day. So I don't know why we, we don't go after them and why we want to play them so often. Should they be better than they are? Yeah, but, well, at some point, we just got to accept that they're not. 25% aggregate K rate. They'll hit for some hard contact, but it doesn't translate into extra bases and balls over the wall. They walk a little bit and hit the baseball on a line and in the air. So where is the production? Where's the run production? Um, it's situational hitting that is really lacking for these guys. Julio hit a ball out last night. Um, Ty France got hit in the face last night, right? J.P. Crawford hit a ball last night. Uh, there were some walks. Um, Gino has been terrible against right-handed pitching all season. Like, so there was a little bit of noise that came in to the six runs that they put up against Keller last night. And that doesn't really mean that I want to, like, go out of my way to get a crap load of Seattle here, but I want to go after Vince Velasquez. The guy has a career ERA of north of five. He's bounced around several teams in and out of the bullpen. He gives up power to both sides of the plate. Um, I know in this shortage sample, we don't that doesn't really display here. But he does not have a three outs above average slider. He just doesn't. He doesn't have a three and a half out above curveball because he didn't throw it all that much, right? So uh, fastball changeup mix has always been bad for him, and this slider is going to regress back to where it is his career averages. So I would like to get to some Seattle, but I'm not going to be happy about it. I'll tell you that much. Um, I mean, Julio's 57 still. Kelnick is fine at 5,000. He's really been cold, though. Like I said, Gino's been awful against right-handed pitching all season. He's 4,600, though, and, and Vince Velasquez will give it up to righties as well. You play Ty France still at 41. That's fine. Um, JP, fine, but he's at 38 now. Kind of, eh, even though he hit a, a bomb shot off of Keller last night. Um, I, I, I really like Cal Raleigh, however. He's my favorite play from Seattle. Uh, definitely from the left side of the plate at 4,600 here. So that's probably where I'm going to have most of my exposure. And it's not going to be with Luis Castillo on the mound at 92. 
same sort of deal. There's too many other guys that I want to play. I'm not eating 40% ownership on a guy. I'm going to have some some Pittsburgh here. It's probably going to make me look dumb once again. Uh, but for the same reason that I, I don't want to eat it on Corbin Burns, um, like Luis Castillo, he's throwing this changeup way too much, and this is a terrible pitch. He has really struggled outside of his last start against Oakland, and he got Oakland. You know, everybody, like, I can throw six innings against Oakland. So, I'm, I'm not dealing with this at, at super elevated ownership when there's 15 arms that we have today. Like, I've said that a few different times, but I, I know the price tag. I know what the projection is, but I think this is this ownership is out of whack. Uh, I think Pittsburgh is starting to heat up and see the baseball a little bit more. That Like, they tore apart George Kirby last night. Uh, he didn't have his best stuff. He was, wasn't locating as as well as he normally does. But the Pirates, this this offense is still very respectable. Even though they are below average, they've had about a month cold streak here since their early season um, sort of production party. 91 aggregate WRC+, plus, but they're still going to walk a little bit here, and they're going to make some hard contact. 31% is not all that impressive, but they're a neutral ground ball to fly ball. Against righties, not a ton of power, but I would like to get to some Brian Reynolds, some Jack Sawinski, and maybe a couple of these cheap lefties down at the bottom of the list, like a Tuki Marcano, who we mentioned yesterday. G1 Bay, I mentioned him. Uh, 3300 now for him. He's not at 5000 or whatever he was earlier in the season. Much more playable price because he's got speed if he can get on base. Um, so I like some of these lefties a little bit here, and I'm going to have leverage against Luis Castillo. I think this ownership is way too high given all the other arms that we have to play. That said, he's, of course, in play, and he is underpriced for the relative upside that he offers with a 28% strikeout rate. If he has the changeup value working and the four-seamer value working, then, yeah, he can really tear apart Pittsburgh here. Um, So I'll I'll have a little bit of coverage with him as well, but it's certainly not going to be anything approaching 40% for me. Um, I think this is how I'm going to take stands today. Look at this barrel rate, like 10.5%. You want to eat 40% on a guy that's got a 10.5% barrel? I so I do not. Like, look at this hard these hard contact rates against both sides of the plate. Um, the, the 37% to lefties, 40% to the right side? No, thank you, man. I am not eating this number. Uh, I'll have 10, probably, is where I'll cap him, um, just to make sure I don't get totally blown, blown out here. But uh, I'll have some Seattle and some Castillo, probably like short stacks, to be quite honest. I... I don't really want to play full Seattle stacks. There's other offenses that I'd rather play. So that's the kind of rant there. Um, and we spent a lot of time on, on that a little bit, but I think it's kind of warranted. Okay, last game here, uh, Washington and KC. Yeah, this game was kind of shocking. It was like the, the bullpens totally imploded. Nobody could get anybody out last night. Um, so let's get to JoJo Gray here. He's made a lot of improvements in the arsenal, of course. Slider, curveball, getting a lot of equity out of them. Fastball really starting to regress. And early in the season, like this four-seamer, he's still throwing it a lot, man. He needs to just stop throwing this so much. Move it all over the cutter. Move it all over, the, over to the cutter. Um, he'll do this eventually, I think, uh, if he doesn't. I, I mean, like, I don't know what our pitching coaches are doing. But... 7200 this is a playable price tag against the Royals here for JoJo. The strikeout stuff is leaving it a little bit on the table here, uh, but the hard contact numbers are great. The soft contact numbers are great. The homer numbers allowed are great. Barrel number is about 10% lower than it was last year. Walk rate is still a problem here to the left side of the plate, notably. It's not to righties, though. He's not throwing it past guys, um, so that he sacrificed a lot of the strikeout stuff in order to not give up so much power. So I'm totally cool with that from a fundamental perspective. Having a little trouble still getting ahead in counts and establishing with these fastballs uh, that would allow him to work to the better pitches, but um, I think he's in play at 7,200 targeting the Royals. They are dreadful against right-handed pitching, man. And despite the fact that they put up 10 runs last night, it was all against a bullpen over there for Washington. It wasn't um, against, uh, what, Patty Corbin, who they had going on the mound. And they're markedly better against lefties than they are against righties. 74 WRC plus here, 7% walk rate, 25% K rate, sub-150 ISO. There's hard contact, yes, but as we mentioned, soft contact and hard contact rates for JoJo are fantastic. These are damn good numbers um, and a total transformation to what he was displaying last season. So I think he's in play as well. If you land on the—I recognize that the projection is lower— 
it's because of the lower strikeout rate. I probably won't land on this a whole hell of a lot, but I think he's in play more, or he should be in play more often than 2% ownership here. Um, he's going to get there more often than 1 in 50 times, you know what I mean? So uh, I think he, I think he's in play. Brady Singer, I don't think he's in play. Uh, unfortunately, he has just been horrendous all season, and I don't think we're going to see positive regression anytime soon for him. Now, he's at a very playable 5,400 price tag against Washington, but I don't want to go after them because they don't strike out. They're not going to create a whole hell of a lot, not going to hit for a lot of power, but we saw yesterday that they put up um, you know, a boatload of runs against a the bullpen. They didn't really get there against Jordan Lyles in an elite spot, uh, but both of these bullpens got really gassed last night, and everybody gave up production. So, um, Brady Singer, I'm I'm really not I'm not into it. So I just don't want to do it. I don't think the strikeout stuff is there for him as a starting pitcher. Yeah, it's a nice price tag, and that puts him in play. Right, nice projection down here for a guy in this range that puts him in play. Um, but he's got a near, nearly 12% barrel rate. There's no chase. There's no swinging strikes. The called strike rate is still high for him, which is really the only thing encouraging. Strand rate, super low, and you're probably going to see some correction in the suppression metrics. But he's given up a full 298 average. It's really to both sides of the plate. 403 Woba to the lefties, 373 Woba to the righties. Power numbers off the charts at 262, 223 to lefties and righties. No Ks, as, as we mentioned, and hard contact here. So... I don't know. I just can't do it. I think you can get to Washington again. I'd probably rather come off of them um, today compared to yesterday because we don't have quite the ownership delta or the ownership dynamic, I should say, that we had with Miami at Coors Field or uh, the Mets at Coors Field, rather. So you're going to see more ownership come to Washington and Kansas City because they're still cheap today, right? Everybody is still cheap um, on really both sides. Really, the price tags haven't changed. So I don't really want to stack the Royals because I kind of think JoJo is in play here a little bit. Um, you can play Vinny and you can play an MJ. You can play a Nick Prado or, or whatever you want. Um, Bobby Witt and, and, and Salvi. Yeah, you can play them if you want to get there, but I think their ownership is going to be too high for their relative upside. Uh, I do like Michael Massey at 2,100. I think that's a fine and playable piece, but I don't want to go out of my way to stack against JoJo right now because I think he's made – significant changes I probably will have some a good bit of Washington because I, I just don't think Brady Singer is um is totally fixed and they're gonna have to do something with with him as well similar to Brad Kelly they're just gonna have to remove him from the rotation because he's given up five runs in in like eight of his 10 starts this season like this is you just can't do it I don't think um so uh, not in this particular matchup. Maybe we'll see some re some positive regression for him soon, but he's been so bad for so long that it's probably going to take a little bit for him to turn it around. So um, I, that's kind of where I stand on that game. Uh, and that is where we are with the breakdown. So I know we still went kind of long here, but we still got 10 games to go through. Uh, let's quickly go through a review. Uh, both of these offenses or both of these pitchers are in play at their relative price tags, more so on San Diego if I had to choose than the Yankees. Um, kind of lukewarm on the game, but three sides, three of the four sides, I, I mean, all four sides are in play. But uh, mostly just the Padres here, I think, for me. Um, don't think you need to get down to Schultons today against Detroit, but you can. He's 5,000, so that puts him in play. Um, and this is Detroit. Michael Lorenzen also in play on the other side, but um, I would like to probably get to some White Sox here, I think, instead of Lorenzen. Toronto and Minnesota, I think both of these arms are in play, as we talked about. Would prefer to get to Pablo and maybe some short stacks of Minnesota. Lefties in particular against Chris Bassett, but you can play a couple of the righties and, and mix them into full stacks if you like. Um, I'm probably off Toronto today. like this spot for Pablo a lot. Texas and Baltimore, I, offense only, I think, for, for me here. Just going to have to take a stand. Um, horrible matchup for Heaney, and Dean Kramer is really not all that good, and it's a horrible matchup. So, uh, yeah, offense there for sure. Houston, definitely. I don't know what Oakland's doing, but we don't really care. Every Everything from Houston, if you can make it happen price-wise, uh, including for Amber. Dodgers, Tampa, pitching only, mostly just glass. Now, I'm probably just going to leave Kershaw on the shelf here. It's a horrible matchup, um, you know, and we talked about the uh, the sort of off-the-field stuff with him. So, uh, glass now only, and probably just in minimal exposures, I think. This is a dangerous matchup for him, too. Philly and Atlanta, probably some Philly targeting some Charlie. I'm going to stay off of Atlanta 
and so that'll probably put me on to Philly or to Zach Wheeler a little bit more, but undoubtedly he has not been great either. Um, so pretty much everybody is is in play here as well. All four sides. I don't really have a strong take here. Um, San Francisco and Milwaukee, I do have a strong take on Corbin Burns. I'm not eating this ownership. I like Logan Webb, and I'll probably have some Giants coverage going after Corbin here. Um, I'm more confident in having Pittsburgh coverage going after a, a more popular Luis Castillo than I am with Giants against Corbin Burns, if that kind of makes sense. Um, so give me some Pittsburgh. No Vince Velasquez. And I'll have some Castillo and some Seattle for sure. Uh, but it's not going to be anywhere near the ownership. I think you can exploit this number. I think this is too high. Um, Washington and Kansas City, and offense again, yeah, for sure, but mostly Washington again against Brady Singer. Um, and sure, if you want to play Kansas City, okay, but like these guys are, this is the most popular game here today. I think you can make some pivots elsewhere and get to some some marginal spots, even though we've got a lot of arms that we can play here. Uh, there's only like three or four guys that we totally X out of the pool. Um, you know, I think there's still some attackable spots because none of these matchups are really all that impressive. You got good offenses going, even against some good arms. So, uh, like I said, we got some noise in the projections and ownership so far. Uh, we should probably have that fixed by the time you guys are seeing this, at least. Um, so keep an eye out for that, and we'll get this vid up as soon as possible. So good luck to everybody punting on the Saturday early slate here. Big 10 Gamer, um... And we will have projections and whatnot for the main as well. So keep an eye up out for those. Good luck.